What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As always, it's your boy Nick. Last episode, we did the Buffalo Bills team outlook. Today, we're going into the New England Patriots. This was hard to write. Before we start, I do want to say we got a lot of new gear up for grabs on the website. We got hoodies. We got regular t-shirts. We even got crew necks for all you swaggy peoples out there. So, go check out the store if you're looking, oh, Jesus Christ, I'm a mess back here. Today's going to be a great, great episode. I have a lot of good insight, I have a lot of good opinions, theories, facts, analysis, nonsense, as per usual. So, let's just dive into it. So as always, the Patriots start and end with terrific Tom, the GOAT, Tom Brady. Due to Deflategate, he obviously only played in 12 games last year. Still finished within seven overall fantasy points of Jameis Winston, Derek Carr, Russell Wilson. So still a dominant year for him. Finished third in uh, fantasy points per dropback, third in completion percentage in the NFL. He threw for at least 300 yards or multiple touchdowns in 10 of 12 games. He only had Gronk for six of those games. He had Brandon Cooks for none of those games. So if everything goes according to plan, he'll have both of those guys for 2017 and arguably the best supporting cast he's ever had in his career. And also arguably the best supporting cast in the NFL on offense. So that being said, Tom Brady is my QB1 this year in fantasy football. At pick 41, he is a value play because Aaron Rodgers is going 15 slots ahead of him. So Brady's my boy this year. So now we start with his weapons. I want to say this disclaimer. Anyone preaches to you, if you read articles, if you read blog posts, if you see videos on YouTube, other channels saying that they know what's going to happen in New England, they're fucking out of their mind. No one has any idea what that diabolical mother f fudger, Bill Belichick, is plotting, is scheming, planning. Hold up, let me get my hat. I need to put my thinking cap on. Also available on the site. Swag dad hats. So the big story this offseason in New England was obviously acquiring uh, Brandon Cooks from the Saints. The kid's just 23 years old. Automatically becomes the wide receiver one there. A lot of people will... Um, assume this incorrectly, right? That Cooks coming over means the end of Edelman. Cooks plays on the outside. Edelman plays in the slot. Despite his size, Cooks is small, 5'10", 190. Edelman's f almost the same size, 5'10", 200 pounds, a little thicker. But Edelman is a slot receiver. Cooks almost always plays on the outside. He does run some routes on the slot, obviously, given his speed and his size. But he is primarily a uh, an outside receiver. He ran... 63% of his routes last year from the outside. So what Cooks does is he adds this dimension to the New England offense that, that they haven't really had. A guy with crazy, crazy, crazy breakaway speed. Almost like, I know there were there were reports and comparisons of Cooks to Randy Moss. Now obviously they're not even close to the same player, but in terms of what he brings to the offense, it makes sense. A deep threat that could beat guys over the top, someone that could take a short ball long, someone that can, you know, catch the ball anywhere on the field. And Cooks brings that to New England, and I think Brady's going to utilize that to perfection. So what I really love about Cooks, you know, he's he's one of those kind of mid, mid third round, early fourth round picks if you're in like a 10, 10, 12 team league. Puts a big question mark only because he's moving teams. You don't question his talent, right? And what I think is there's no way Bill Belichick and, and Robert Kraft would have went out and signed this kid if they didn't have crazy good plans for him. I think they're going to be utilizing him like nuts in this offense. So right now, uh, Brandon Cooks is being taken around the 25th spot overall um, as wide receiver 13. I think he's a really good bet to finish as a mid to high end wide receiver two, And I think he'll have a handful of high end wide receiver one finishes week by week sprinkled in there. He'll definitely have his 10 catches, 160 yard touchdown kind of games in this offense. Um, we saw it with him in, in, in New, uh, New Orleans. So there's no reason to think he won't do it in New England. Obviously, you know, them having so many weapons, they're going to be cannibalizing each other's targets. So a lot of people think that that probably puts a puts a ceiling on it, which it which it realistically does. But I'm kind of banking on the fact that he's he's an elite talent, right? And he's a guy that that the Patriots haven't had and Bill Belichick's going to know how to utilize him. The volume does kind of does kind of put a limit on where you could see him finish. He was like wide receiver. He was in the wide receiver like 8 to 11 range uh, where he finished overall in both his years for the Saints. 
I, I think it's going to be very hard for him to, to beat that finish, to crack the top eight in the position for fantasy this year. I would say, you know, you have guys like DeAndre Hopkins getting picked before him, Todd Gurley, which is in, insane. I would take Cooks over both those guys. But I also would probably take Lamar Miller and Travis Kelsey, who are going after him, before him. So I think my overall view on Cooks is he's a great addition to this offense. I don't think you should let the fact that there's other weapons there hold you back from drafting Cooks in the third round. I think he's going to get his opportunities. I think they're going to be able to utilize him and line him up all over the field. Bill Belichick is so smart at, at putting his talent where it needs to be and utilizing them on a game-by-game -game basis. And Cooks should lead the outside receivers in targets. He should lead the team in yards. And, you know, it, it should be a big year for Cooks. Which leads us to Julian Edelman. Since he's taken over... Wes Welker's spot, you know, as a little white guy in New England, he's averaged nearly 10 targets a game since 2013. Now, his target numbers are almost definitely going to drop this year, just with the addition of Cooks, with Gronk being fully healthy, hopefully. But I still think he's a decent play where he's being picked. He's being picked at wide receiver 28, uh, pick 55 overall. And he's always been, like consistently, every year, a big part of that red zone offense, a big part of that Goal line offense, they, they give him those dump off passes. I mean, they're not always touchdown opportunities, but let me say, he's averaged 0.55 targets inside the 10 yard line per game since coming over in 2013. So he's getting an opportunity down there every other game, if not more. So while I think his target numbers dip, obviously from that 10 mark, I think he's a safe, safe, safe play to still see seven targets a game, if not more than that. Because like I said, Cooks is on the outside, Edelman will still be lining up in the slot, and that's such a, uh, a heavy utilized position, no, no matter who's been playing it over the years, right? Whether it's Edelman, whether it's Welker, Brady always relies on that position when he's going for those short dump off plays. So I think I think by the time drafts will run, Edelman is gonna continue to be undervalued. And I think he's a good, a good floor play for, you know, like a sixth, seventh round pick where he's going. What does kind of make me nervous about Edelman a little bit is you saw his touchdown totals drop from seven in 2015 down to three last year, uh, despite seeing almost the exact same red zone, exact same red zone targets. And he actually saw three more targets inside the 10 yard line last year than he did the year prior. Still scored less touchdowns. So uh, he was a lot less efficient last year, but that was his season low in touchdowns over the last like five years since 2012. So I, I do expect you know that return to the norm, maybe uh, five touchdowns, six touchdowns. So I, re I really don't hate Edelman this year. Once we get past Edelman, we have Danny Amendola, who's kind of fantasy irrelevant. He took a pay cut to re-sign in New England, turns 32 this year. He hasn't played a full 16 game slate since 2010 without an injury to Edelman or without an injury to someone on this offense or a few people on this offense. Check this coffee mug out. Swig. My friend does, you ever seen, um, what the, f horrible bosses? You know, motherfucker Jones, Jamie Foxx, and he's like. My friend does the greatest impression of that. I don't know why I just brought that up. All right, so after those guys, we actually have a pretty interesting position battle here for the third wide receiver spot behind Edelman and Cooks. Who's gonna be playing opposite Cooks on the outside in uh, three wide receiver sets? It's gonna be between Chris Hogan, and Malcolm Mitchell. Malcolm Mitchell's this young kid. Last year was his rookie season. He played in 14 games. He had a decent rookie year for given the role there. That doesn't really produce a lot of um, stats. You know, the wide receiver two role uh, in which he didn't play the majority of snaps anyways. He racked up 400 yards, four touchdowns, and he had flashes. He had a few impressive games. He had a four for 98 and a touchdown, five for 42 and two touchdowns, eight for 82, four for 41 and a touchdown. Those were all four consecutive games in a row. So we got on a little bit of a hot streak. The problem was like he's always been an injury concern. I remember leading up to the draft, a lot of teams were saying he's undraftable because of his medical history coming out of school. He had a torn ACL amongst other injuries and we saw it right away in camp. He, he messed up his elbow and a lot of people thought it was going to be season ending right away. Ended up rehabbing from it, coming back. You know, Mitchell's got good size. He's 6'1", about 200 pounds. I think he's more of a dynasty stash. They're already keeping him out of a lot of the mini camp practices and Chris Hogan's been dominating in the wide receiver threat uh, sets. The three wide receiver sets in terms of like practice time because you know they're concerned about Mitchell's health. 
He's not injured now, but they don't want to run him more than he needs to be ran. So he's still young. He's still learning. I don't think either of the guys have a great upside. And like I said before, in this offense, that position is kind of irrelevant on a game-to-game -game basis. It's very, not irrelevant, but it's very hard to predict. I personally think Hogan played well last year. I ended up starting him in that one game where he went off for like five catches, 114 yards, and a couple touchdowns. Like randomly, I threw him in one of my lineups, and I was like, let's go. But he caught 38 balls, like 680 yards, so almost 700 yards four touchdowns. An interesting fact about Hogan though, last year he was the first Patriots wide receiver since 2012, Wes Welker, to have multiple games of 100 plus receiving yards and he had two of them. They haven't had a wide receiver since 2012 to have multiple games of 100 receiving yards or more. That's crazy considering how, how much production comes from their passing offense. So he had he had pretty good regular season stats. He absolutely dominated their playoff games, right? They had three games obviously at Houston, Divisional uh, Conference Championship against Pittsburgh, and then I forget what was after that. Maybe the Super Bowl or something. In those three games, he combined for 17 catches, 332 yards, and two scores. So Hogan ended the year really strong. I think that continuity plays a big role in how Bill Belichick and Tom Brady feel about him. And I think he earns that, that starting spot, that role in that offense. So what I would say is in redraft leagues, I would definitely side with Hogan for this year. In dynasty leagues, definitely Mitchell. Check their ADPs. Chris Hogan is going 219 overall, wide receiver 62. I think that's great value there. Honestly, great value. Mitchell's uh, literally the next pick, 220. So they're they're going at the same spot. I think Hogan wins that job. I do think they're going to be splitting snaps. As long as Mitchell's healthy and can get on the field, they're going to let the kid run. He's got a lot of raw talent, and he could play a role if he comes on and plays well. It's hard to predict what's going to happen there. Uh, but again, having Gronk back is going to hurt everyone's upside. Cook's going to take a lot of targets there too. So neither of them have a lot of upside. Speaking of Gronk, this begins and ends with your risk tolerance. Uh, if you're a fantasy owner that doesn't mind taking risks, Gronk's your guy. He's an incredible value. Right now, he's getting picked 21st overall. Obviously, the tight end won. And he, you know, he's been a top 10 pick in fantasy drafts for like the last five years straight. So, you know, the injury risk finally caught up to his ADP. He is just 28, and he's had three separate back surgeries already. He's a young kid who's had these back surgeries. So there's definitely still an injury risk, even if reports say that he's coming into the year healthy. I'm fine taking him in at 20, 21, 22. If he drops into like the early, mid, even like pick 17-ish, 18-ish, I'm going to be a little hesitant there, especially because you have, you know, Jordan Reed available 20 picks later, Greg Olson available 40 picks later, Tyler Eifert 50 to 60 picks later. I think it's a value thing here at that point, a value versus injury risk kind of thing because, you know, these guys like Greg Olson haven't missed a game in 20 fucking years. I don't want to spend a second round pick on Gronk, an early second round pick, if if I, you know, if I don't want to risk it. They also lost Martellus Bennett this offseason, brought in Dwayne Allen from the Colts. Both of those guys were complete tight ends, so they bring in a guy who's kind of just like masking what they lost in Bennett. Dwayne Allen is a very underrated blocker, so he's going to be utilized a lot like that last year, and it's a reason we saw Martellus Bennett struggle in games where you expect him to do well. Like when Gronk was out, Bennett had a lot of terrible receiving games statistic-wise, and it was because they asked him to block so much. But I do think their line improved a lot. They're a top 10 line according to Pro Football Focus this year. Their line really came together, so maybe they don't ask the tight ends to block as much. So Dwayne Allen could be a little upgrade at the tight end position. Reports are saying he didn't have a great mini camp, and he's not a lock to make the roster. I think that's absurd. They wouldn't have gone out and traded picks and you know, went out of their way to get the kid if they didn't want him on the team. I do think the tight end two role is always, always, always produced in this New England offense as long as the tight end is an actual pass catcher. And I would consider Dwayne Allen a pass catcher. He's an all-around tight end, and I think he would surprise this year. And I think as long as he's healthy, he will finish within the top probably 13, 14, 15 tight ends and probably surprise a few people. Um, right now, he's going at pick. Dwayne, where you at? 192 overall. Tight end 22. So I, I definitely think there's value there. He's not someone I want to start in my redraft league if it's like anything under 16 teams. Um, but you get what I'm saying there. There's going to be value. He's going to have his games. They always score touchdowns from that position. So, you know, I don't hate I don't hate Dwayne Allen. <sighs> now we move on to the running backs. One of the harder, harder, harder paragraphs for me to write here. A lot of a lot of different names. They have four guys in their backfield now, right? They have LeGarrette Blunt moving, of course. Uh, led the league in touchdowns last year, 18. Led the league in red zone rushes, rushes inside the 10, rushes inside the 5. Still let him go. That's what New England does. They don't care. They don't care about nothing, man. Because I got high. Um, 
So they went out and signed Rex Burkhead from Cincinnati. They went out and signed Mike Gillisley from Buffalo. So those are gonna be their early down runners. Almost all the reports are saying that Gillisley has this job locked up. He's gonna be replacing Blunt. Makes sense, he's about 5'11", 220 pounds, almost ident identical in size, maybe a little bit smaller than Blunt was. ESPN Boston's Mike Reese, I think is a reporter, basically said that Gillisley is definitely the favorite to win that job. You know, I would have loved Burkhead's upside, I would have loved him as a sleeper had Gillisley not signed. Because uh, he played well in Cincinnati, he's a, he's a back that could do it all, he could block, he can catch, he could rush. Very, very small sample size, and a lot of people are going nuts because he had a that really big game against Baltimore at the end of last year when both Jeremy Hill and Gio were out. Uh, I think it's ridiculous to take a one-game sample size. However, I was watching tape, I wanted to watch a little more film on both of these guys before I gave my analysis. I think Rex Burkhead is a more talented player, a more talented runner than Gillisley. When I watch Gillisley, nothing pops off the screen to me at all. He's a big runner, not afraid to put his head down, doesn't have good shake and bake. Very similar to Blunt, not a great skill set, not a great talent by any means. Fortunately for this New England offense, you don't need to be that type of player. Like You're going to produce numbers in this offense given the opportunity, just given how the system runs so fluidly. Uh, so that's fortunate for Mike Gillisley. And when you look at Gillisley, like why why do you replace Blunt with Gillisley other than the size, right? Blunt obviously produced so much for them inside the red zone, inside 10-yard line, by the goal line, right? That's what Gillisley did last year. I know a lot of Shady owners will say that uh, he vultured a bunch of those touchdowns. Shady out-touched Gillisley at every part of that field, 20, 10, 5. Gillisley was just so effective within the five. He went six for six, rushed all six of his attempts, four touchdowns. That's why the Patriots went out and signed this guy. When you lose a guy like Blunt, who's so effective there, you need to find another guy who can fill that role, and that's exactly what Gillis Lee's gonna do. So, in an offense that's on the up and up, somehow the Patriots are, yes, on an up and up with all these additions, Gillis Lee, you know, it's really easy to project him. At, obviously, 18 touchdowns is ridiculous to project him at, but you could easily see double-digit scores this year. Blunt had 24 carries inside the five-yard line for this team. So I, I think people have gotten really, really, really high on Gillisley. Uh, I remember when I first started writing this article, he was he was like ADP of like 85 to 90. He's since dipped down to 65, um, running back 23. And honestly, towards end of August, I only expect that to keep coming down and keep coming down further. I am a little weary of Gillisley. I loved him at his value before, but if he keeps going down, I don't know if I'm going to have a lot of shares of him because one, you know, it's just ter it's a really, really small sample size that we're just assuming he's going to fit that Blunt role, right? Blunt had 300 carries last year, 299, had double digit carries in every single regular season game. Gillisley only had double digit carries in four games. So we're getting a really small sample size. Albit, he did produce well in those games, right? He averaged 14 carries in those games, averaged 5.5 yards per carry. Nonetheless, I don't like predicting based on really small sample sizes. It usually comes back to bite you in the ass. And again, I might be in the minority here. I know Gillisley's young, like 26 entering his prime, but I just don't think he's that talented of a back. When you watch, go on YouTube and just type in like Mike Gillisley highlights. When you watch him, nothing pops off the screen at you. He's a pretty average runner. That Bill's line is just very, very good. They created holes, they got him into space, they got him into the second area where he just puts his head down and mashes people. So I think it was a product of that. You saw McCoy was also averaging 5.4 or 5.5 yards per carry last year. And lastly, dude, this England, New England offense is just scary from a running back perspective. Nothing ever happens that you think is gonna happen here. Rex Burkhead is likely to take some of those carries, right? So. You know, Blunt had 300 carries last year, so you're, you're going to split that up between two guys, Burkhead and Gillisley. G Gillisley should get the majority of those touches, even if it goes 180 to 120, 200 to 100, right? Anything really could happen on a game-by-game -game basis, and if Gillisley does secure that role, then yeah, he's got great value. He's going to be a beast. The team is always leading. They're always in a rush-friendly game script. But I just, like, I I feel like I've been burned too many times by the New England Patriots backfield that I don't, I don't know if I could confidently be like, yeah. You know, like, what is the last time you went into a season and you were so this sure about a New England back being the guy there? Like, never. That never happens. There's never a New England back 
that you go into the season and are like, yep, I'm taking him early. He's my guy. He's going to be their back. Even last year, Garrett Bolton was going in like the 10th, 11th round. I'm just saying, if, if Gillisley drops into like the 5th round, I will be passing on him in the majority of leagues, even given his upside. So let's talk about the other two backs. Of course, we have James White and we have Deion Lewis as the pass catching backs. They have two guys in their backfield, these two, that are better than almost every other NFL team's one pass catching back. So when you look at the two, White has had over 100 receptions in the past two years combined. Finished last year as RB24 in PPR leagues. Lewis can't stay on the field enough in order to put up those kind of numbers, but he's averaged almost four receptions a game in the games that he has played over the last two years. Unfortunately, it's only been about seven games, or it's been, I think he's played in seven games in each of the last two seasons. So clearly, you know, he's got this injury history. He's got he's got problems staying on the field. Deion Lewis is the greatest Madden player you could ever use. His juke, his spin are at like a 99. It's probably irrelevant, but it's interesting nonetheless. New England is 16-0 in games that Lewis has been active for them, including playoffs. So where does this leave him to? White signed this offseason to an extension through 2020. I think New England really likes both backs. I think that they would prefer to use Deion Lewis if he could stay healthy. Uh, but, you know, reports are coming out that White is probably going to be the guy this year. He's gained a lot of trust with Bill and Tom. I love that, Bill and Tom's law firm. And the continuity there is just building for them. So I think that they are going to at least start White at the beginning of the season in this pass-catching role. But I think a lot of that is also hanging on the fact that people are looking back at that Super Bowl performance that White had. Dominant, you know, just absolutely dominant performance. Rushed for two touchdowns, and this hurts me to say. Rushed for two touchdowns, caught 14 balls for 110 yards and scored another touchdown. So three overall touchdowns, like 140 total yards, 14 catches. Craziness. So people are like, yep, he proved that he's the guy. But look back at the week before that, the conference championship. He had four touches for eight total yards. The week before that, the divisional playoff round, Deion Lewis had 15 touches and scored two touchdowns. It just goes to show you how fragile this position is on a week-to-week -week basis. And for you to confidently say that James White is going to be the guy there, is is naive so when i first started writing this article which is probably like a month and a half ago their adps were almost identical they were within like 10 spots of each other around the 140 to 145 range since then james white's up at pick 120 overall running back 42 lewis has dropped significantly he's over 200 i think he's like pick let me see 207 as running back 67. So I think they both have good value there because whoever plays that pass catching role always produces in this offense. So I would take either guy in redraft leagues. Lewis obviously has to be a deeper league because um, you're probably going to need an injury or some kind of change of heart in that offense for him to get on the field. But I've, I'm finding myself owning a ton of James White in play draft leagues, in uh, which is best ball, right? You don't have to start your guys. You just play and they automatically start the best guys for you. So I'm owning a ton of James White in those leagues because, you know, he has very high ceiling on a week-to-week -week basis. Oh, God, I'm out of breath. Jesus Christ. That's going to wrap it up for this New England Patriots outlook. I hope I just, I feel like I didn't really even put opinions out there. I just threw a bunch of numbers and let it stick to you guys. That's what I'm doing. So I just give you analysis of what I find. You guys can decide what you want to do there. So I want to end with a question as always. Would you rather have Mike Gillisley or would you rather have Amir Abdullah or Dalvin Cook on your team? If you could choose one straight up. Also, are you taking Malcolm Mitchell or Chris Hogan? And do you think Brandon Cooks finishes higher then DeAndre Hopkins and Sammy Watkins. I want to hear your predictions. And again, thank you for joining me. Follow me on Twitter. Go check out the blog, all that kind of stuff. Go shop some gear. Get swagged up for the season. So again, thank you for spending your time with me. I'll see you all next time.